definitely. That sounds great. I already see the first question is uh, how to start learning creature animation. Take Eddie's course on creature animation at Griffin Animation Academy. That is where I uh, learned how to make this shot and how I improved my animation skills. So I highly recommend it. And I'll be showing you my process and like little sneak peek into how our courses were uh, on that shot. Yeah. What was, um, so before you start, what was your creature animation experience? Um, In the course? Lead, no, leading up to doing Oh, yeah, yeah. Have you, did you do any before? So um, I didn't do any like professionally before, but I did do a short film that has three creatures in it. So mm -hmm. I did have a little bit like indie experience for that, but not really um, anything in depth and nothing mm -hmm. photorealistic either. Okay, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this course really helped me like push my skills. Nice. Yeah. And, and, and I'm Alicia Steinberger and I'm the maker of the shot Tigress and Butterfly, which I will present to you right now. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Sweet. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no. Does anyone have any, qu have any questions? I can't even speak today. Before it starts. <laughs> I think you can just start and okay. the questions roll in and yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Oh, can you make me a host again so oh, I can share? I Sorry, my bad. Uh, I trust you. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. And click the optimize video. Yeah, got it. Okay, perfect. So, um, I'll be presenting to you my shot and the progress of how I made Tigress and Butterfly. If I can get this thing to work. Cool, so I'll show the shot to you just in case anyone hasn't seen it. Nice. And I'll just um, go through what I did during making the shot and also what I did before. So my first step was to find references um, because I think a lot of times I have an idea in my head, but when I look at the idea in other people's art forms, it helps me visualize it even better. So I took a lot of illustration into consideration. So I, they have a lot of dynamic poses and like great line of action, you've got these stretches, this squash. It's even good to look at like anatomy of the creature you're working on, or like for me it was the tiger, so I looked a little bit at the anatomy, but I didn't go really in depth in there, but I feel like if I wanted to do even more realistic animation, I definitely should look at more anatomy studies, like muscle, bones and stuff, just to get the proper uh, movement into my creature. So I took a lot of um, reference from illustrations as you can see, a lot of great poses and I love how they draw these uh, strong uh, felines in their different like in action and while resting. It's really cool like you have all these great shapes in here and I really wanted to get it like nice shapes into my animation like you can see here is like a triangle shape and sculptures is really great i think because you can see a lot of um volume you can see where the muscles bulge out where there's maybe some fat coming out or like where the where the weight lies in the creature so where the center of gravity is which is like the sculpture can only stand if it has a really sturdy cog and you can see how this nice like c curve here as well the other way around is like really beautiful stuff and of course, you can also take great references from photos from uh, real cats in the wild. I don't know why I took so many taxidermists, but definitely take some from real life as well. And then last but not least, of course, a lot of um, video reference. So this is um, all the references I used for my shot. And you can see where I drew a lot of inspiration from. Most of them are big cats. Um, some are obviously not. There's, uh, I think, some small cats and some dogs and some horses in there. I kind of just tried to find what I could. And then 
you, uh, of course, you need to scale your creature up or down depending on the weight of the one you are trying to animate. So if you take reference from a cat, like a small house cat, for example, you need to scale it up, like make it slower, make it heavier, um, just to match the creature you're trying to animate. For me, it was the tiger. And then secondly um, is theory. So after an analyzing a lot of reference, there's some... Um, things I found or that I also read online in some great blogs, for example, by Daniel Fotheringham, which I'll present also later. Um, and basically it just helps analyze the reference and helps like clarify what is happening when you look at the reference so you can understand it better and not just copy it. Um, so for example, one thing that is important to remember is that to balance its center of gravity, the creature needs to have a strong foothold. So the best way to do that is to have the best or the most um, space in between its legs, and that's how they walk. So you always see like triangles um, where they place their feet. So that's always, uh, if you're ever in doubt, you just try to find what's the most balanced pose for your, for your animal. And then also, this is not really um, stuff for my shot, but it's things I thought was good to remember or good to know while I was animating. So here, for example, you see that cats specifically um, place their back legs where their front legs left. So um, you can see, like best you can see in this reference, where it just exactly puts his foot right where the front foot left. And um, it's, I don't know if this is like 100% true, but I think dogs don't do it as much. So you can see in the dog tracks, they're a little bit more offset, while the lion tracks, they're more perfectly like in on, on top of each other. And also one thing I learned from Daniel's blog, which I'll share later, uh, is that oftentimes the back legs mimic what the front legs are doing, but they're just offset by half a cycle. So if you see here in this reference, the front legs, like the right foot lifts off first, and then the back, the right foot also lifts off first, and then it does a little hop, and then the back legs just a little hop. And whenever the front legs slow down, the back legs also slow down, but just half a cycle delayed, if that makes any sense. Um, and I just thought this was helpful to block out my shot because um, just knowing a few like theory things really helps with uh, your idea. And then of course, it's important to look at reference to see how it looks like in real life. So you can see this in this cat's, uh, when it starts from a trot and goes into a run, you can see that the front legs initiate it and then the back legs kind of follow. Let me just skip ahead to uh, 122. So here you can see oops, that it's trotting and then the front legs speed up first here, and then the back legs follow. So that's a good thing to note. But of course, you can see here the front right leg lands first, but the back left leg lands first. So that's where reference comes in real handy because this is not a perfect um, cycle that is just moved back by a half a frame or half a cycle. You can actually see that they, they, they run differently. And depending on the species is also different. And one thing I thought was really cool about cats and big cats is that their head motion is really still compared to a lot of other animals. So obviously this cheetah is a lot lighter, a lot skinnier uh, than, a, than a tiger, but um, you can see kind of the same thing happening in the tiger where the head motion is very still compared to the body, especially when it's locked onto a target. And um, when it's gaining speed, it still uses a little bit of head motion just to get the speed there, like you can see in this reference. But once it gets up to speed and once it has its eyes locked onto the target, it's pretty still. And then one thing, also a very great tip from Eddie, uh, is if you look at any reference, you can see that their thighs and ankles are very parallel to each other. Um, so that's great for blocking out your shot to see what pose works. So in case you don't know if your back legs are standing right or anything, just check that the ankle and the um, thigh is parallel and that's pretty like ballpark correct. 
and then of course size and weight so depending on like because the tiger I was animating is a lot heavier than any house cat um, I really wanted to make it look heavy of course that's something I struggled with a lot and I still struggle with um, but it's um, basically anything heavy moves a lot slower or has a lot less or it accelerates and decelerates much slower so the curves and the graphs will be a lot more like eased out at the tips and then there will be a lot more overlap and secondary so if you look at this clip that I put together with these cats fighting each other you can see that they stop moving pretty quickly and there's not a lot of like secondary overlap and stuff it's all like very contained versus these tigers fighting and this is all real-time speed and it's um like every kick like it wobbles a lot um, because of its fat and its um, like muscles and all that so that's good to keep in mind as well just to make sure that your creature looks the size and weight that it is because it's too easy to make something look light in CG and here's just really quickly and very very basic how I visualized it for you guys but of course this is not completely accurate but anything small could turn a lot faster and could accelerate and decelerate a lot faster and anything big would have a lot of ease on the curves so um if that makes any sense is this is this uh too dry is this okay eddie no it's great keep going okay okay cool cool, cool. Yeah. Okay, sweet. <laughs> i was i was scared i uh lost you guys oh no we're still here Okay, awesome. And then one thing I really wanted to use to my advantage was that the bodies of tigers are extremely flexible. They're really squashy and stretchy. And how Eddie taught me to look at it is that the head, shoulders, and hips are like uh, three bouncing balls, basically. And they're kind of tied together with this elastic body. So um, instead of animating it as one huge piece of like the, just the body itself. Um, I wanted to separate them to give a little bit of overlap so that it looks more like fluid to give it more like organic life. So that's what I will show later on how I set up my Maya scene to do that. And then for personality, of course you gotta look at your own creature, but I just thought that um, snow leopards are so fun. They're so cool. And they have so much like strange personality. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys these cool clips of um, snow leopards doing awesome things. So it's these kind of small, fun moments that I think bring your shot to life. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of, to do with body mechanics, but any small thing that your character does, like if it shakes its paw or if it like looks around, shakes its head a little bit, that's something you can add to your shot just to give it more life. And that's a lot of what um, Eddie told me or Eddie suggested in my shots, which made it so successful um, because it had so many small details that gave it a lot of personality and life. So here I will show you uh, the process of how I put together my Maya scene to make it um, good for animation, basically. And I followed um, Daniel Fotheringham's blog on this which uh, is so good and you should definitely check it out. It's got so much great content uh, and it basically, it, it talks you through like step-by-step step how you can make your shot really good. And I'm just gonna do a really short version of that. And so basically he goes through how to do basic staging, finding reference, and then analyzing it, front foot. So uh, uh, isolating your character so you only see parts of the bodies at, at one time. Um, this helps you focus in on this part of the animation and making that really nice before adding other parts. And then, um, so we already found our reference and then we analyzed our characters. So now we're just gonna go into building our Maya scene and blocking it up. So here I, uh, I'm showing you how the rig is set up. And for this, I used, um, I used, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name again? Let me just, real quick, I need to go find uh, your name. So, Ashish Sharma, that's uh, whose uh, animation I'm using for this. Sorry for forgetting your name, Ashish. My bad. So, um, here, this is a 
walk cycle by Ashish. And uh, here I'm just showing how the rig is set up and how the controls are represented in the graph editor. So for the chest and the hips, they are obviously they are in um, they are relative to this middle COG control. So when you move the COG, you'll see that it's actually walking through space, but you cannot see this in the hips and uh, and the chest controls, which is a little bit hard for me at least to understand where my character is moving in space. So what I find really helpful is to parent these two controls to objects or locators so that they move separately and they actually move or they're represented to be moving through 3D space in the graph editor. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So here you can see how all the um, rotations and all the translations are completely different from what we're used to. So translation Y, obviously we think it's up and down, but um, for this creature, because it's relative to the COG, it will be forwards and backwards. So it's a little bit like confusing. So what um, is good to do is to parent things. So here I'll show you, um, for example, um, how you can parent uh, a cube, for example. I, I used a cube because um, it just helps with showing the rotation of your chest and hips so you can see where the shoulders are going. And you can also see if it's doing any strange gimbling issues. So um, you can like, see me struggle through this. I know there's much better ways of um, doing this quickly. Um, I'll still have to use, learn to use the Maya tools. Um, so basically you just parent it and then bake it out. And then you parent the control to this baked out locator or object. And then you'll have much cleaner curves in the end that will represent what your character is doing, which I'll show you later on. So what I find is important is to set your rotation order to ZYX because um, sometimes, not sure if you uh, have this as well, but sometimes the curves kind of mimic each other in the rotations and it's kind of annoying because you can't figure out uh, what is doing what because these two kind of do the same thing. And then when you're trying to correct some issue, it might make more gimbling. So gimbling is when you have like crazy rotations which I think I'll show you next. Like when I just delete these few curves, then the like the body does some crazy stuff that you obviously don't want. And it's hard to fix it, especially because these two curves are working basically exactly against each other. So if you just change the rotation order, um, it'll help sometimes with um, these gimbling issues. Sometimes you have to bake them out and then change the rotation order again and then bake them out again. It's a little bit complicated. But basically here I'm showing how you can change the rotation order. So you just go into your object and then you go into your uh, attribute editor, change the rotation order. You can reparent it, rebake it out, and then parent the con controller to this object. And then it'll give you a lot cleaner curves. So I'm just uh, doing that. And then here you can see how the representation in the graph editor for the chest is exactly what you see in space. So you can see that translate Z, it's actually moving through space. So that's really good to know. And then translate Y is actually moving up and down. So you can, it's much easier to correct like your um, ups and down poses with this. And then obviously the translate X is going um, sideways. And the rotations are also acting exactly how you would expect them to act. And this is just really, I think, good setup. Um, obviously, you can do it other ways as well. You can also start by animating the COG and then baking them out, or like however you work best. I just thought that this was a great tip from Daniel and from Eddie to help separate the hips and the chest to make a really fluid movement and make it really um, like dynamic, I guess. So. Here is just another. Alicia, yeah. can I read oh, out yeah. some questions to you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, before we go on, I think this yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are there any tips on animating stylized uh, big bad creatures? Ooh, big and bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess um, are they like probably made up creatures? I'm guessing. Is that right? Yeah, I'm guess I'm guessing like uh, giant large creatures. Like yeah. Or something of that scale. Even dinosaurs. Like, yeah, know, right? 
Yeah, I, I definitely think, um, so even if they're made up, it's, I think it's great to look at reference. So um, you want to see how your, your creature is physically built. So does it have a really big uh, upper body or a lower body? And then that's where your weight is going to be. And then that's where you're going to want to try to balance your creature. And then for dinosaurs, this was actually a great webinar you had before, uh, uh, someone who was doing um, freelance dinosaurs. And they brought up a really great point that um, oftentimes when we see in the movies is we see dinosaurs with their legs kind of bent and then they're roaring, but there's not actually a lot or any um, uh, reptiles that roar. So scientists think that they didn't really roar. They might have made like a low growling sound, but not really a roar. And they would most likely have walked on straighter legs like elephants. But obviously that's not something we're used to. So it's just good to know these kind of reference things, I think. And then um, for like more stylized creatures, for like more cartoony stuff, I guess, I think it's good to um, uh, look at, again, look at reference, but also look at um, what kind of environment is your character in. So is it really, uh, is it still, on this planet kind of with the same kind of physical laws like gravity and stuff. And that's all stuff that you can add into your animations and make it still look really heavy. Or if it's really small, make it look extremely light and playful. I think, I think that's, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that. So maybe Eddie, you can actually give some better advice. But that's what I have to yeah, say. That's, uh, that's, um, I guess that's what you, you kind of do is you, you source different and similar animals um, mm -hmm. and you kind of make it appealing like again like you're bringing up dinosaurs um, because they're kind of like birds they would have walked with straight legs mm -hmm. um, that's yeah yeah appealing in film so you kind mm -hmm. of blend that in with say a quadruped where they have nice you know z shapes on their back yeah. and just a nice weight on the elbow but in reality if they weigh I don't know, 20 tons or whatever, they're just going to mm -hmm. collapse. If they're going to rely on their upper legs to hold them up, which is why they have straight legs. Right, so, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that just becomes a, um, a thing where you just design how they mm -hmm. would pose and look according to what you like as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's great. Um, so another question for you. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we have Daniel Fotheringham doing a webinar for us in, oh, no way. Yeah, probably next month or yes after, but I am definitely yeah. joining that one he, he's a mate of mine so I managed to con him into coming on coming yes on <laughs> good job um, so which method do you use for creature progressive cycles oh what does that mean like um, um, your method is just the just the way you went over, like finding references and then blocking it out and step keys. And then... Yeah, 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 exactly. So I'll also go into more detail on exactly the process of the shot. So now I'm just doing like before the shot, how I set up my rig and stuff. So my process, I guess, would be to uh, set up the rig so that it's easy for me personally to understand what's going on. Because I like to see in the graph, I like to see the representation uh, of what is going on in um, 3D space, instead of having to like battle two graphs at the same time that are doing the opposite thing and stuff. Does that kind of answer the question? Oh yeah, it does, definitely. Okay, cool. Uh, and where do you find um, reference? Ooh, that's a good one. So um, mostly I find it in, on YouTube or on Google Images, but I know there's like, um, Oh my gosh, you, you, you shared with me one before where I found a lot of reference as well, where they have a lot of like loops and stuff and GIFs. Um, don't quite remember what it's called, but I, uh, so the easiest way for me is to go onto YouTube and just type in what I want to find. So if I want to find a tiger jumping, I just search for a tiger jumping. And sometimes you can't find the exact thing you want um, because there's a limit sometimes to the creature you're trying to animate. Sometimes they don't, they're not like tigers aren't, they're endangered. So there's not tons of reference of wild tigers out there, but um, you can always source from similar animals and then like adjust the weight 
and the anatomy to the creature you're animating. So I took a lot of random references from dogs and stuff who are doing athletic things, and I just try to scale it up and make it more cat-like. Um, so as you saw in the reference, the dog, they move their heads a lot, and um, cats just don't move their head a lot. And then obviously dogs' feet placement is different, so I'll adjust that to what a cat would do. And that's basically um, how I stitch together my reference. And I also like to, this is one thing I learned that was really helpful during the course as well, is to really find reference for every bit and piece of animation I'm doing. Because um, sometimes I can visualize it in my head, but it just won't come across or the weight isn't quite right, something's wrong. And as soon as you find reference, there's like a whole new world has opened of uh, opportunity because the reference will show you things that you never would have thought of and it'll show you the correct weight, spacing, timing of everything that is moving, um, if that helps. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Cool. I think you answered um, Tao's question, which was when you were gathering your references from different size cats, how did you account for how the different weights and how yeah, that yeah. affects how you uh, how your model moves? So I think totally. you'd answer that one. Um, yeah. And uh, let's do one last question: Is using yeah. faster control bad for the movement in in Z Z axis? Is using a what control? Sorry. Uh, the master control yeah in like um you know the main control to got it yeah yeah, yeah. through space yeah What's is it? it bad for the movement through space is that what they're saying yeah i'm guessing like it's just a different way of totally yeah yeah i think yeah, yeah i think it's um totally depending on what your style of animation is or how you approach or how you understand it best for me it was just easier this way because I could see the the body, the head, and the oh, the, the hips, chest, and head separately, um, just because that was easy for me. But obviously, there's you can make the same quality of stuff using a completely different method as well. So I think if it works best for you personally to use the main control to block it out or to even do the whole animation, it's that's totally cool. <laughs> Oh yeah, thanks. I'll let you push Sweet. on with your presentation. Okay, no problem. Thanks Just so. let me know if there's anything that you want me to go more in depth or if anything is too dry, I can definitely skip stuff. Oh, no, nah, everything's great. Everything's oh, cool. Great. Sweet. <laughs> cool. So here's just like a quick overview or like summary of uh, Daniel's blog as well. So for me, it was important to represent the curves accurately in the graph, so that's what we, did, what we did. And then also something he talks about is isolating the creature, as I said before. So um, you would do the head and chest first, then you'd do the front legs and animate it as a biped, and then you would add the hind legs in. You can just block them in to be the same as your front legs, but offset by half a cycle. And that gives you a very like ballpark correct kind of movement for your quadruped. Um, and the one thing I heard, I think Eddie told me and also other people told me before was that it doesn't have to be 100% realistic, but it needs to be 100% believable. So sometimes you'll look at reference and it looks completely crazy or weird when you put it into 3D and it just doesn't look right. Then I feel like for me, you can definitely or I can definitely like change it to make it look more believable or more something that I don't think is CG. So sometimes when you look at cats' tails, they act really strangely or they're really stiff and it just doesn't look real, especially when you put it into 3D, then it's not believable at all. And then so I took a lot of liberties with the tail. It's a lot of like overlapping, a lot of flowy motions that you can't really see in the reference. But like in other things too, you can, uh, you can exaggerate some things um, just to make it more... Um, like clear what you're trying to animate, I guess. Of course you can, this is all just my opinion. You can uh, have your own opinion as well. And then I think it's also important to keep the creature on model. So this is one thing that Eddie was going back to in the class often. So 
uh, you can push the poses or I push the poses a lot, but sometimes they went out of proportion or like that's not something I could find in a reference that a cat would actually do. So um, it's good to find references for poses you want to have or you want to hit and then um, uh, try to match that in your 3D and try to keep it on model so that your creature stays believable in the environment so that it doesn't like so you're not stretching it too far, you're not compressing it too much, not getting strange angles in the neck, for example. Like that's something that was really important to me. And then <laughs> this is my mini journey from becoming a beginner to not so beginner anymore. And this is some great credits I wanna give. So thanks, special thanks to Eddie for being my mentor. Uh, and then for to Nora for doing the amazing effects in the shot. Uh, to Kyle Figgins for the Sabertooth Tiger Rig and Trong CG Artist for the Jiggle Script. And this is something I'll show later. And there's also more credits to come later for stuff that is happening to the shot right now, which is really exciting. So stay tuned for that. So for the very start, I wanted to... So I had an idea in mind and I just wanted to visualize it. So I did that by making a 2D animatic. Um, so I just roughly drew out what I wanted to see. And then I found some reference that shows what I wanted to have in the shot. And so basically I had the look figured out. I wanted to have like dappled light. I wanted a tiger playing with some, um, some butterflies. And my intention for this was to show like a playful tiger in its environment. It, like it's, it's strong and powerful, but it's very graceful as well. So um, here, I will show, okay, here's another important thing is that in CG, it's very easy to make your camera look fake, obviously because it's very smooth or the key frames, you can, you can smooth them out a lot. So one thing that was helpful to me was to use a camera track so you can see that this um, is actually someone took real footage and then um, tracked it to a LiDAR so that the camera is moving the same in 3D space as the recording and that just gives the camera more uh, lively feel it's more grounded in that space it's not doing any crazy stuff um, so it's more believable as well and then this would be my initial blocking um, I like to block in stepped just because um, I get more clear poses and I don't need to care too much about the like timing and anything that's happening in between because just because I find that when I do uh, block out and spline, I go into too much detail too soon and before anything is ready for detail at all. So that's just my way of doing it. And then this is something that um, I was talking about earlier. So isolating parts of the body. Obviously this is like not even close to <laughs> or remotely close to um, cleaned up at all. But so you can just see how the head and the the shoulders move and you can correct that kind of motion. And then when you add the legs, you can adjust the height and stuff of the torso to uh, fit the head, uh, the, the leg length. Here I have a bit of refined blocking. So if you saw in the earlier version, the tigress was doing like a backflip uh, at the very start. Let me go back there. So, oops, let me go back one more. So she does a backflip on the first log. And that to us just, it was, I thought it was really cool, but it wasn't realistic enough. And because I wanted this to be more of a realistic shot, um, I decided, or Eddie and I both decided we should take it out. Um, and then, but once we took it out, there was kind of no climax to the shot. So uh, we decided to add uh, a second jump in it, which would be the climax of the shot. So here you see her jumping forwards. That's much more realistic. And then she jumps down and then does a big leap and then slides into the water. So that's like the basic idea that went to the final. So we have a forward jump and then climax and then it like slowly slows down as she jumps into the water. So that was still stepped. And then now we're going to spline. So it's gonna be really rough. A lot of timing is off, obviously, and then um, there's barely any weight. The feet are sliding around everywhere. But um, that's, that's how it is like, I guess. And then 
So these are some great effects by Nora. This is the initial effects pass. So the, you can still see that the animation is relatively rough. Some, uh, the weight is not quite there yet. Timing is a little off. And some poses are not fixed yet. But um, it was enough for Nora to get started on the effects. I don't remember if she did this in Houdini or not. But I'm going to say... I'm going to say it's Houdini. I might be wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's really great stuff with the effects, I mean. And then, so one thing I had a bit of trouble with in the rig is, and sometimes you have these in rigs that you don't have a lot of facial uh, controls. So this was my initial face, and you can see there's not much expression going on. Um, there w just wasn't too much uh, deformation in the face that I could work with. And the tongue rig was relatively limited as well, so I built myself a tongue, and then also made some blend shapes, so that this one's like a growl, this one's like an extra relaxed, this is the default, and that's like a snarl, just so I could add that in just for a little bit extra um, personality. Uh, this is not something that you need to do, but I just think it's good if your rig cannot, doesn't have the ability, it just adds one more layer of uh, um, believableness. Be believableness. Cool. So, Oops, can I play this? I guess not. So uh, here, let me just see why I can't play this. Are the videos playing all right, by the way? Are they like up yeah, to speed? Yeah, it's Sorry? It's pretty smooth. It's close okay. to as uh, real as possible, I think. Okay, perfect. That's great. Awesome. So yeah, here, um, this one is pretty much final animation, but there's no muscle jiggle or anything. Um, and then I blocked out the environment. Uh, what I thought was important in the environment was to get some depth into the shot. So I have some foreground, some overlay stuff like really close to the camera, some background stuff. And I didn't care too much about what was in the far background. I just left that blank. I just thought it, it, it's nice when you stop at any frame and you can see like framing like on the right and on the bottom. I just thought that was important. And then here, this was really cool. I found this right towards when I was making the shot at the end. It's Trong CG Artist's Muscle Jiggle script. And I'll just show you uh, how cool it is. You can see it mostly in the thighs and in the stomach in the arms and the neck, so before and after. And this is all using the script and there's no simulation needed. So everything is keyed, but it's relatively straightforward and easy to use. So here I'll, uh, it's going through how to set it up. It's relatively simple. Um, you just need to add it in. And he has a great tutorial that I'll share as well um, on how to set it up and exactly step by step what to do. So here I'm just setting it up. As you can see, it's like um, you're going into the mesh and then creating like basically muscle jiggle blend shapes. And then you have a control for each muscle you want to have. So if you want to have one for the thigh, you put one there. And then this is like, you just need to know some basic skin weighting stuff. I'm not anything close to good at skin weighting or rigging or anything, but it was easy enough to understand. So you just kind of paint in where you want the muscle to jiggle around, you smooth it out a little bit. And then you have your jiggle controls ready. And then, so what you can do, what I did for animating the, on impact of like the arm on the ground or anything, the muscle will shake. So it'll go down, up, down, up, down, up. And then like slowly like ease out. And then when it's, Preparing to jump, for example, I'll have the muscles tense up, so bulge out a little bit, just to give it that, like, when you flex, your muscles get a lot bigger. And then, so, just to make that look a bit more convincing that she's actually pushing off of something. And then, anytime, like, there's some, like, jiggle in the uh, neck, for example, or stomach, whenever there's impact, 
just um, stuff like that to make the tigers look a little bit more real, I guess. Actually, I don't think you should uh, full screen it, Alicia. It gets kind oh. of blurry. Oh, is it? Okay, my bad. I think just, because uh, of the optimization when you're screen sharing. Okay. Is that better? It's a bit better, yeah. Okay, I'll just show the uh, final result real quick again. Is that better? Oh, uh, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, thanks. No problem. How did you learn uh, blend shapes? Facial blend um, So I, sorry? Uh, Paolo was asking. Oh yeah, um, I actually le learned it from Goody. So uh, he taught me how to uh, do it real quick. So there's a lot of tutorials on YouTube as well that you can find if you just hit, or if you just enter how to make blend shapes Maya. And where um, can we find a Goody? Sorry? And where can we find a Goody? Uh, you find him at home. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go out and grab your one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. So, um, yeah, it's great having him around because uh, he just teaches me so much about everything. Like, he's such a generalist. He knows so much about all sides of Maya. And uh, he even taught me how to use the graph editor. Like, without him, I wouldn't have started 3D. It's so great. <laughs> and so, making blend shape is actually not very hard. Um, the basic Basically, you just duplicate the mesh and then make different expressions of what you want. And then you can think of those as keyframes. So you have the, the um, normal keyframe, and then you have an extreme of one sort, and then you have an extreme of another sort. And then when you blend shape them, you get like a slider, and it basically goes in between these two keyframes. So it's, um, it's really helpful if you want to do some quick addition to your rig. It's not that great to do like detailed stuff. I mean, I guess my blend shapes were just weren't so good. If you make really great blend shapes, I'm sure it will work perfectly. Yes, but uh, it's really helpful to know the, these small kind of things. It'll just help you be able to use your rig to its full extent, if that makes any sense at all. So um, to get the blend shape, or no, to get the jiggle, set up, you can just go, I, I have the link here. So basically you just go and visit um, Trong's site and you can download it. It's by donation, which I think um, he deserves a big donation from me for using this script <laughs> for so much. And then he has a really in-depth tutorial on exactly how to set the rig up. So you can check that out as well. Oops, let me go back to my slides. Cool. And then this is a cool edit that Eddie put together for me for my class. And uh, it just basically shows from start to finish how the shot progressed and um, yeah, how the final product looks, basically. And those effects turned out really nice by Nora, I think. Oops, I forgot I wasn't supposed to full screen it. Was that okay to see? Uh, yeah, because it's a high-res video, I think. So. Got it. Okay, okay. Cool, so this is really exciting for me and for everyone, I think, as well. So the next steps for the shot, which is something I'm not involved in as much because I don't know anything about anything like this. So the next steps are looked at for lighting and rendering. And this is by Alejandra and Jorg. I completely butchered the names, but I hope you forgive me. Um, so they're super talented. And they have made some great progress to the shot, as you can see here. So this is, I'm going to just guess what this is. I think this is like look dev and rendering tests. So they put a lot of textures onto all the assets. And then they have like um, subsurface on the, on the tiger, I guess. And the water just looks beautiful. Just want to go swim in that lake. 
and um, they have now fur for the tigress. And we're taking reference, or they, they were uh, suggesting that we should do a um, golden tiger, which I totally agreed with because they are so beautiful. These are golden tigers, so they're just, they're just, they don't have as dark stripes as the normal tigers have. And here are some render tests of the uh, environment and the water. It's very magical. So this is one like early uh, test with, with and without motion blur. So the first one is without motion blur. The second one has motion blur on it. And then, so one thing uh, which was the most feedback I got when I posted my shot online was that the camera didn't quite look realistic enough. So even though I did take it from a tracked camera, I changed up a little bit and added a little bit of like, like panning up and stuff to follow the tigress. And the most feedback I got was that it wasn't convincing as like a real camera or like, like a real camera person wouldn't have made those decisions or wouldn't have moved that way. So um, I got some great feedback and some great suggestions. So one of them was to use your own phone to um, try to move like your, what you have in your shot. So I started like up high and then like zoomed in, like moving and following something and then zoom out, come out. And then I would bring that track into Maya and then, and then try to match all the, jiggles and and stuff and the uh the delay in the camera so one of the feedback was that when my when my tiger jumps the camera follows too exactly because i was just too attached to my animation to cut any of it off but of course that's something i have to sacrifice to get a realistic camera move because obviously your camera is going to be a lot more delayed so this is one thing i edited for the final render oops let me actually make that small so, okay, let me start that again. Oops. So here you can see that it's a lot more janky, but I feel like it, it looks a bit more realistic. And then when she jumps, there's a much longer delay, so it cuts off a lot more of her body for a few frames, which I hope helps the issue a little bit. Let me know if it doesn't, and then I'll change it more. <laughs> So there's more um, handheld feeling to it, right? That was the totally, yeah, 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 totally. Like doco almost. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. As if someone is like actually walking through the forest, holding the their camera. Yeah, behind a tree or something, and just kind of. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks I hope gorgeous. it's working a lot better. Sorry. Looks gorgeous. Nice one. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. And then this is really exciting. So they just sent this to me this morning and it's the render of the fur. And I added, so before I had these um, spheres that were flying around her, but then I added actual moths to make it look a little bit better. And I just think it's really gorgeous. I just want to watch that again. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing. Oops, oh gosh, I'm so bad at this. Let me, can I full screen it or will that go bad? I think you can full screen it. Okay. Yeah, it looks amazing. And they used Yeti uh, fur system for this. Um, I don't do a lot of fur, but I know that it's uh, it's pretty solid in its um, simulation and stuff. It's not too hard to use of course i don't use it so i don't know really um but what i do know is that you can't render it in the u.s for some reason so if you're in canada you can render it uh from canada but not in the u.s it looks amazing i'm yeah, super is, stoked that is very nice yeah and then the little butterfly has a glow on it it's so beautiful yeah even like the uh you know, the the moths? Fairy butterflies or moths, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's to the jungle feeling, right? Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's great. And it has this kind of magical feel to it with the dappled light and all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, nice work. Yeah, good job, guys. <laughs> and then just before I close off, I just wanted to share, or if you have any questions, I can do that before this. I can also do it after. But I just wanted to share some great tools. These are just 
a few of the bunch I got when I asked what kind of tools people use because I don't use any animation tools at the moment, but I do want to use some because it just helps with the workflow. And I've heard that like so many great stuff about them, how it like speeds up their work progress or process. So here's some really great um, tools. This is one that I was talking about earlier of how to isolate your body, uh, body part. So you can just click on it and then it'll like hide the arms or hide the legs or something like that. And then this is just great for um, creating proxies so you can see the motion in space without having to scrub or without having to draw over it. Same as, um, oh no, this is the ghosting mesh. And then for creating proxies would be like if you have a heavy, uh, mesh or you just want to see the motion of the torso you can create like a sphere uh, Just to see how that's moving and then for face uh, to save like on a shelf To save your facial expressions. You can use um, this one right here And then just because I want to take this great opportunity to um, to present and thank you guys so much for being here. And I just wanted to say that um, this means a lot to me because um, tigers are going extinct and it's really sad. Um, so the estimated amount of tigers left in the wild is just 3,000 to 3,600. And that's like less than the amount of people that reacted to my shot when I posted it online, which is very <laughs> devastating. And um, you can see here like all the reasons for tigers losing their habitats. Um, and the biggest reason is palm oil. So um, you can help by just not buying palm oil products because it really destroys a lot of um, uh, uh, forests, uh, rainforests where they live. And then illegal um, poaching and then uh, selling for medicine and stuff, which I really don't understand. <laughs> I just hope that it stops at some point. And it's crazy that in Ontario, it's legal to own a tiger, but not legal to own a pit bull. Like something needs to change in the laws. It's crazy. And then um, if you're in the US, you can, um, you can learn how to pass the Big Cat Safety Act. So this will protect um, big cats, any kind of big cats, like um, tigers, lions, bobcats, blah, blah, anything. And then that it'll put a restriction on who can own these cats which they should not be held captive at all, um, and how to keep them. So um, hopefully we can help that as well. And then very lastly, there's this new um, bill that will be passed, or they're trying to pass this weekend here in Canada, uh, which will um, make it illegal to report animal cruelty on farms. So if you want to check that out and sign a petition to help not um, make this bill be a thing, you can click on the link below. That'll just help animals on farms um, because they, we need to know what they're going through. And I think it's very important and I hope it's important to you too. Um, so yeah, I hope that's not too, too much of a downer. Thanks so much for attending. <laughs> that was great, mate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and I'm reading any... uh, the palm oil and animal cruelty. Totally, yeah. Yeah. And as as many of you know, like Eddie and I were both plant based, mm -hmm. and I just think that's a really if if you can like consider living a plant based lifestyle, it's much better for yourself and the environment. I think. Yeah, get on it. You're yeah. Feeling great. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for that. And look, look how jacked he is. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for that presentation. That was amazing. No, thank you so much for attending. Um, I can read out a few questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and make sure to thank those uh, mates of yours for the renders. They, absolutely. That was, uh, I think they might be even here. Oh, yeah. I'm not so sure. Can I check that? The support. <laughs> I think so. I asked if they wanted to talk, but um, I think they're they're a little bit shy because English is not their native language, so which I understand. So that's totally fine. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I'm Aussie. I barely speak English, but I'm doing it. Anyway. <laughs> with, a, with a really great accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you give some tips or things to remember while doing a blocking on a creature? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, blocking stage is really important. And I think it's, um, it's good to spend a lot of time on blocking because that'll make your life a lot easier. Uh, when you're da down the road, when you're doing your spline and cleanup. Um, one thing I found very helpful was 
to always check your animation from above because you'll be able to see the motion through space um, and if it's moving correctly, if it's going in the right trajectory, if it's going the right speed, and you can see all that really well from the top view. So I would always check top view a lot. And then I'd make sure that all my poses are pretty solid, that their center of gravity is like where it's supposed to be, it's not tipping anywhere. So like make sure your, uh, your uh, poses are on model and match them to some reference. Uh, and then um, that, that'll give you a really good base uh, before you go into splining and uh, detailing. If you have anything to add, Eddie, you can definitely add it. Yeah, don't feel like blocking has to be done in a certain amount of time. And I mm. tell everyone this, um, blocking can go for, for weeks and weeks and even months. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you can even go up to eight weeks and still be changing the timing and the, you know, the framing, the beats, um, mm -hmm. that doesn't have to be like sorted out by, you know, the second week, uh, you can yeah. really stretch it out and keep working on it. And then it makes the final polishing stage a lot quicker and a lot less headaches and back and forth. So mm -hmm. if you feel like you're falling behind or feeling pressure. If you start to just, you know, it eats into like a few weeks of blocking, just make sure you're, it's all, it's all planning. So make sure your planning is really just feeling good before you head into like detail stuff. And oh, I know everyone yeah, yeah. like gets impatient and wants to just like start adding the cool stuff, but <laughs> the cool stuff has to be blocked in and feeling good before moving on. Yeah, totally. And then um, one thing that we were going through in our class a lot was uh, changing small things on the idea. And that's always great to do in the blocking stage as well, right? So before you go into like any detailing, once you do the detailing, it's much harder to go back and change like the overall idea. Yeah, exactly. So which animal will you animate next? <laughs> um, that's a good question. If it's a if it's like a feline, I definitely want to do um, a snow leopard because they're just so crazy. Like, it's insane what they're able to do. Um, but also, I really want to do, like, a mythical creature, like a dragon or something like that for my next project. That'd yeah, be... Someone mentioned dragons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's That'd be really great. Or even just, like, a cat, like Bubble Tea. I would, like, cat, <laughs> Bubble Tea is my cat, by the way. Not that I want to animate Bubble Tea. <laughs> Didn't we inject some of... Uh, bubble tea's personality into this tiger we did we did so um uh if you look at the shot let me just really quick it's it's really cute how she um so bubble tea my tiger am uh, i not my tiger my cat <laughs> she she's very um like light-footed she'll always pat on things before she uh steps down so you can see this happening right uh, when right before the tigress is about to jump, she pats the the wood, and that's exactly what Bubble Tea does right before she like walks onto something, just because she's really scared of things, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess like animating Bubble Tea that would be that'd be a dream too. <laughs> and um, you know, finding those little personalities and behaviors to add into your creature, your character, just makes it feel more. Uh, real like with the you were saying with the foot placement yeah totally your character feel like it's a younger cat right like less yeah. experience in the world and, yeah uh, trying to find its footing mm -hmm. no totally that's so true and also like just like you said um i guess the age of the animal or creature matters a lot too on how it behaves yeah exactly yeah, and this this great foot shake that everyone loves so much. Everyone loves this foot shake, and that was uh, that was Eddie's idea. Uh, all cats do it, I guess, when they step into water, especially house cats. But this was a reference t taken from a bobcat who jumps uh, and uh, lands halfway in the water and like shakes the paw. It's really great. Yeah, I also uh, noticed that on my cats after they yeah. get out of the litter box, they're like, really? <laughs> 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 totally, yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, what about um, particular muscle systems like Ziva or something? Yeah, I've seen a few times. Is it worth 
that in the Maya scripts? Um, I guess like those, uh, like Ziva would be much more realistic and it would be much more like high def. So you'd have like, because I've seen, um, you work for Ziva, right? So <laughs> I mean, I'll just say what I've seen. Uh, so I've seen um, like how they have muscle and skin and then they have like the, all the different, so they basically model out all the muscles and then they have like overlapping muscles and stuff. And it all like, it's all very realistic and of course the script you can make it like mimic the realistic aspect as well but um it won't match the same level so if you want to do it the next step and actually give it that kind of skin and muscle uh then definitely go for a ziva but i just don't know how it works and i guess i'd need to ask someone who's familiar with the program or the plugin to um, help me on the shot as well because I don't think I could do that myself. Yeah, and I think Ziva is a lot more expensive. Mm. Uh, um, the setup, I think, just for the tools itself, uh, it mm -hmm. requires a TD uh, creature artist and totally, yeah, yeah, um, definitely like gets you the most realistic results. Absolutely. Yeah. Ziva does some crazy stuff. If you uh, want to look into it, it's they've got really great like uh, media or like really great video clips. And then they have like great breakdowns on how it works. And it's cool because they start from like the bones and then they build it up with the muscle and then the skin and like all the stuff, which really brings the creature to life. So definitely look into it if you're interested in like realistic creature animation. Yeah, and your Jigo script is uh, essentially a an affordable option for everyone. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's perfect for us where we can just grab it and throw it on and it gets you nice results. It's not going to get you Ziva results, but it's going to get yeah. you another level to... Totally, yeah. The rig. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Definitely. And then I think it's um really... Let me see if I can find it again. I think it's really um, easy to use as well. Let me just see if I can quickly find it. Oops. And it's it's by donation, so he only asked for one dollar. Um, but I obviously I would suggest uh, giving a lot more than just one dollar because it's really a really great script. So you can just see how. Um, like the before and after there's such a like world of difference I feel like to how real she looks the animation is exactly the same but I feel like after I add the jiggle it just makes her look more like a like a grounded creature if that makes any sense yeah definitely um, it just brings you uh, into reality a bit more. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. Does uh, anyone else have any other questions for Alicia? I'm just searching through. <laughs> um, what was your biggest difference? This is from me, by the way. Yeah. What was the biggest difference for you in terms of starting this shot mm -hmm. and your life after the shot? Ooh, um, that's crazy. Yeah, in, like when I say that in a sense of... Um, being an artist, are you more confident and did more opportunities mm -hmm. come to you and things like that? Yeah, totally. So um, before making the shot, I didn't have a lot of, or I didn't have any experience making um, realistic creature animation, even though that's something I really wanted to do for a long time. And I kind of put off learning it just because I, I uh, like there was another project I was doing and then um, I just thought I wasn't ready yet because I thought, if I if I start now, my creature shot won't be as good. Or if I if I learn a little bit and then I start my creature shot, then it'll be really great. So I think that's something a mindset that you can't fall into because it's never too late to start learning, and it's best to start learning as soon as possible. So uh, I feel like if I didn't do this shot, I wouldn't be as good as I am now. And if I waited to do the shot. I would have just postponed getting to the same level. So definitely start as soon as possible and whenever you can. And um, uh, like 
when I was making the shot, in my mind, I was like, I'm going to make this so epic. It's going to be so real and everything. And then halfway through, I started getting really sad because I was like, it's not at the same level as I thought it would be or like I imagined it to be so much better than it is. But then like you have to just keep pushing yourself and it will get there. So like I feel like I learned so much and I improved so much during the shot and it really turned out quite epic for in my opinion um, because of all the great tips uh, that Eddie gave me and that, that I learned on the journey. And I definitely did get a lot more um, opportunities. So. One thing also is, um, like, after I uploaded my shot, I thought it was just done and that I could move on to the next project, which I can, but it wasn't done because people were interested in making the shot even better. So, like, Alejandra and York, they um, messaged me and asked if they can do, like, look dev on it and fur and everything, which is so cool. Like, I didn't think that that would happen. So now it's even it's going like beyond me it's going like out there and it's gonna be so great so that's one thing too like don't your project isn't done when you're done with it it's like it'll the life will continue when it's out there on the web and stuff and also one thing i think is very important is to uh, keep your maya scenes clean i didn't keep it clean because I thought I didn't need to because I was like, nobody's going to look at this. But then it turns out I have to give it to someone else. And it was the terrible mess. <laughs> and I don't know how they got through uh, sorting through all the crazy stuff I had in my shot. But yeah. And yeah, right now, I think the industry was like not too active in the past weeks because of the pandemic. But it's growing a lot again right now. So I think uh, now is a good time to apply for jobs and stuff. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm. That's what I'm hearing. Is that a, is that a good answer? Yeah, that's a great answer. Trust in the process. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And just again, be patient and just believe in your in believe in the process. Really, it is a process. Absolutely. You know, it's not just like a an accident that you yeah that with a in an amazing shot. It requires correct decisions as you go making mm -hmm. right choices and you'll get there eventually yeah 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 totally um and there's another question for you what is uh, yeah. next for your career moves um did you want to do more like creature quadruped stuff things like lion king or mm -hmm. what yeah what interest yeah moving forward oh that's so that's so cool um i do want to do like realistic creatures uh, and stuff like Lion King. I would love to work on Lion King if ever a sequel comes out or anything like that. Um, but I also I also have like so many other passions. Like I love cartoony animation. Like I love Frozen too, and and uh, Pixar and stuff. So I I also want to do that in a way. And uh, game cinematics, that's such a huge, like that's one of my big goals is to get into game cinematics as well, because they just do, I really like short condensed projects. Um, it just gives you more uh, exploration and then you can, it, you're not committed to something for too long. So I think that'd be really cool to explore. Um, but also I'd love to continue doing like in, independent short films. I do love um, making my own ideas and stuff. So that's also something I want to do, which I would definitely love bringing realistic creature animation into like my short film ideas. Yeah, and uh, making something cool with it. Yeah, nice one. And if no one else has any other questions, I'm just gonna wrap this up. Anybody? <laughs> Maybe we'll just wrap it up then. All right, that sounds great. Thanks so much for uh, attending, everyone. Yeah, and thanks for your time. You know, time is uh, it's a precious thing. So mm -hmm. it's uh, valuable. No, it was great. Yeah, so. Thanks for having me. I'll jump in a video here. Yeah. yeah. And that was an amazing talk. And, you know, when you have the final renders up with the guard rays and everything, yeah. Just yeah. Post it up and let us know. I want to totally, check. yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for uh, joining and for listening. Yeah. Thank you guys for attending and
yeah, again, thank you, Alicia. <laughs> no problem, no problem. I hope it was helpful for everyone. I hope it yeah. wasn't too boring and dry. Very informative, very detailed. Yeah, so, cool. All right, guys, thank you. Cool, Thanks thank you. See you guys.